Good morning, everybody. Well, welcome to the Bloomington Church of Christ. I'm glad you're with us this Sunday virtually. Dee's going to share a few thoughts, and then I'm going to share a few. Okay, good morning. Um, I just wanted to share um, some of the things I've been thinking and feeling this past week with everything that's going on. I've had a lot of feelings, just anger and sadness and even helplessness and hopelessness. And I was actually texting with Liza on Monday, which was super encouraging. Um, we texted for a bit and then she asked me, what can I pray for you about? And so I just wanted to share what I um, wrote to Liza. She shared some perspectives with me and then I want to share what I texted back to her because I think it pretty much sums up what I wanted to share this morning. Um, so Liza, thank you. What you texted me was so eye-opening. I feel so many things all jumbled together. I feel shame and embarrassment. Somewhat, I guess, because I'm white, but mostly because I've not stood in someone else's shoes for longer than a few minutes, which is no time to really understand and feel and see the ugliness and the injustice that that person is living in. I can't keep being dull. That is certainly not the heart of Jesus. I want to listen and I want to help bring the kind of awareness that will lead to change. I think that's what God would want from me, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk with him, and to care deeply about all of this, and not just to, just to stop at caring, but actually acting. First John says that, um, that we love not with words or tongue, but in actions and in truth. And I was feeling a lot of that this week. You know, we have all recently studied about the kingdom, the parables of Jesus, and I wonder now, it's kind of like that was really a good thing to study right before all of this was happening. And um, it made me remember, you know, what God's kingdom was and what God calls me as a part of his kingdom. And he calls me to be a blessing um, to the people around me. And I can't be a blessing if I'm not involved in people's pain and suffering. I can't be a blessing if I won't act justly, if I won't listen, if I won't engage in conversations that might be painful for me or expose something in my heart, something that I don't understand or haven't considered or something like being dull. Um, you know, I'm still praying about practically what that looks like for me, but I believe that, um, that God has my attention. Um, from this and that I have ears that are willing to hear and so my prayer has been the rest of this time as I learn more and understand more and um, that God will lead me to do what he's calling me to do. Amen. Appreciate those thoughts. I also wanted to share um, on Monday night there was a call with about 350 leaders of churches in, the North, in North America and some across the world and the host of the call um, were what's called a diversity team that the International Churches of Christ, our family of churches, has developed. The diversity team's been around for years, uh, but they just wanted to help give some thoughts, give some perspective. And so it was about a 90-minute um, Zoom call. Uh, like I said, 350 participants, leaders from around the North, North America, some in the world. Two takeaways that I thought were helpful for me, maybe they'd be helpful for you, is is just to acknowledge we all we all feel the injustice and just to acknowledge that that uh, th this is there's always injustice but this this particular one really gets our attention and and even recognize that some people because of their past are going to feel the injustice at a deeper level yeah. and we should be aware of that uh and i'm i'm more aware of that um and then secondly the idea that who we are is important and Jesus said in John 18, verse 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And we're part of the kingdom of Jesus. So even though we're in the world, we're not part of the world. So we need to have different perspective. We need to have a different response. We, had a, we need to have a different everything. We, we need to have a Jesus perspective as best as we can figure it out. We need to have a Jesus heart towards those who are hurting. Uh, so, you know, the cliche, what would Jesus do? It's really worth our time and energy at this time, my time and energy to try to figure out, I want to respond like Jesus would respond because I'm in his kingdom. And that is different than this world. Let's pray. 
God, we thank you that we are not part of this world. Uh, we are in it, but we operate completely different than this world because we're part of your kingdom. And help us understand what that means. Uh, it's not obvious all the time. How should we respond? What should we say? What shouldn't we say? Uh, what do we do? What do we not do? There's, there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of feelings about seeing uh, people killed in, in ways that you just can't imagine it would happen. Um, but just let us, God, give us insight, give us wisdom. Let us respond like you would respond. And, uh, and as we go on with the rest of the service today, I uh, pray to just bless the service. Uh, let us commune with you through the service today. And, uh, let us really just be the best people of your kingdom we can be. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Uh, there'll be a couple songs coming up. Uh, hope that they help you focus on you and God today. Thank you. It's great.
Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning, church. It's great to be here with you this morning to discuss uh, our time of communion and our contribution this Sunday. I think we've been in a time of relative isolation for about the past two months now as social distancing measures kind of continue and I know things are kind of in a state of flux. I think it's easy for Satan to use this time of distance and relative isolation to kind of get in our heads and think some of the thoughts that it's easy to pop in are things like, how will my loved ones be okay? What will happen to my job? Is it safe to go back to work? When will life return to normal? And I know for me specifically, some of the thoughts that creep into my head and have creeped into my head in the past two months or so have been, how will things economically, like a macro level, a big picture level, affect my job uh, and therefore my family at a micro level at all? Um, will my employer be affected? Will my job be affected? Will my mom, who's kind of in a vulnerable age segment uh, for COVID-19, will she be affected? Will she be okay? Satan says that he's going to take this time of relative isolation and seclusion and turn it into a time of fear. But Jesus says that we have nothing to fear. Turning your Bibles with me over to John 14 verses 1 through 4. Verses 1 through 4 read, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. You know, Jesus has prepared a place for us. He even tells us that we know how to get to that place, how to get to him. As we take the communion today, let's remember that Jesus died on the cross so that we don't have to worry and live in thoughts and life of fear. We know the way to Jesus. We just need to go looking for him. Go ahead and bow your heads with me as we say, or take a, uh, say the prayer for communion. Well, God, I just want to come before you, Lord, and I'm just so grateful, Father, that you sent Jesus, God, that Jesus died on the cross, Lord, so that we don't have to live a life of worry and a life of fear, God. You know, in these uncertain times, times of flux, times of change, times of illness and economic instability, God, you know, help us just to remember that the most important thing is throughout all that change and all that flux, that Jesus is constant, God, that you are constant, Father, and that Jesus was sent to the earth, not so that we had to live a life of worry, but that so we could take our worries and burdens and give them to him, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now church will kind of transition over to both our regular contribution and our giving for those in need. So with the physical restrictions that are on place and being together, it's easy to turn many of our thoughts inward and focus on ourselves and our family units. And that's not in and itself a bad thing. We families need to be taken care of both health-wise, emotionally, physically. There's a lot of good and uh, things when it comes to taking care of our families. But it's also important to be prepared for what's ahead. But also, I think it's easy, especially because we're not meeting together, potentially be less consistent in our giving. Um, you know, let's read in James uh, chapter 1, verse 12. James 1, 12 reads, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know, this is an area in our giving that we are uh, able, have the opportunity to stand steadfast under trial, under uncertainty, under times of change. Um, you know, whether that means mm, sending funds on Venmo, putting a personal check in the mail to our financial administrator, Robin, or setting aside the cash that we normally would have given in person on Sundays, whatever that looks like in this time, let's not allow our current circumstances to cause us to be any less consistent in our area in giving with our walks with God. Let's persevere under this area of trial. Go ahead and say a prayer with me. 
Well, God, I just want to say a prayer, Father, help us just to know that, you know, giving is an area where we can, I think it's possible to be perfectly consistent, God. And not that the goal is perfection, Father, but there aren't very many areas in our walk with you where that is really, I would say, an attainable possibility. But I think giving is, God. Help us just to be steadfast in our offering to you, God, in this time of trial. Um, yeah, and just help us just to be consistent, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And for our giving for those in need this week, we're going to be giving to the COVID-19 relief efforts of Hope Worldwide. So let's go ahead and say a quick prayer for our special giving to those in need. God, just pray that you're with us, Father, in this time of trial, in this time of need, God. Um, help us just to bless the work, or please bless the work, Father, of uh, Hope Worldwide as they go and they look particularly to distribute food and medical resources to those in need, God, and those affected directly by COVID-19, both in the U.S. and abroad. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, church, I want to thank you so much for letting me share my thoughts with you on communion and on our contribution today. Hope you guys have a great rest of your Sunday. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to talk to you this morning. Um, appreciate uh, Brother Matt Marvin's um, speaking to us earlier. And um, just wanted to share some thoughts with you this morning. This is um, a message or a devotional that, um, that I did with Amy and the kids a few weeks ago. And I uh, thought it would be encouraging to share with us this morning. And the title of this is, The Lord is My Shepherd. Now, for many of us, as soon as I say those words, there's probably a certain psalm that comes to mind. Come on. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Mm -hmm. He leadeth me besides green pastures. He restores my soul. And so on. And I asked Amy and the kids, I said, so we see this imagery a lot in the Bible as God being our shepherd. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of toss around some of the ideas as to, to why. Um, what makes us think of God as a shepherd? Uh, we talked about God's love, how he's caring, how he's nurturing patient, um, protective, um, et cetera. I mean, other things like that. And, you know, just tossing that around, we said, okay, that's great. And that's, that's all of those are true. And we could think of so many others, I'm sure. Um, but before we get into that in more depth, um, I want to go back earlier in the Bible and look at the first time we see that word for shepherd. And that's in Genesis chapter 2. And it's in verse 9, and I'll read that. It says, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that word evil is actually the same word we see for shepherd. And you're like, what? How is that possible? You know, I've been studying out the book of Genesis and, and really trying to get to the depth of, of, of what it's trying to say for the last couple of years. And... You know, as, as I was looking further into that word for evil, I just came across that and and um, what that word meant and other uses for it in the Bible. And the word is spelled with two letters only, R and A. The Hebrew letters are Raish and Ayin. I'm sure I'm pronouncing those wrong to some extent. Um, but... That's what it means. It means evil. It could also mean wicked. It could also mean to destroy or to consume or be consumed by something or someone other than God. Examples of that may be an addiction, being consumed with an addiction. Another example may be anger. 
you think, well, anger isn't evil, and it's not evil. Um, but being consumed with that anger leads to bitterness. Ultimately, ultimately leads to rage, content. Mm -hmm. We see way too much evidence of that each and every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but if we add the letter H onto that, or hey in Hebrew, just one consonant, we change the gender of that noun from a masculine to a more feminine noun, such as example that in in English would be a son to daughter, both children, but a slight difference in um, just the gender of that noun. So it gives us a better idea of what we may be looking at here as we dig further, because other words that we may see also translated as shepherd in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we see this, this word ra, many times. It's also translated as my friend or my love or my beautiful one. We see in the Song of Songs, it's the same word. Mm. But I want to look closer at that, that where we see that used as friend. And we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 33. Come on, God. Exodus 33, we'll start in verse 10. It says, Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. You know, I look at that, and we look at that word for evil, for friend, and what it's trying to convey is God having a consuming passion for Moses, his friend. Mm. A passion, a, a relationship that that is, is all-consuming, a relationship in which God says, I am giving you my all, everything I have. Come on. And with that comes a certain vulnerability. I mean, not that God is, you know, vulnerable, vulnerable to being hurt physically in a sense, but, but God feels anger. He feels sadness. Mm -hmm. He feels joy and happiness. Mm -hmm. He feels, um, you know, when his, when his children are, do things that, that, that are contrary to, to who God is, that are contrary to his love. I mean, by, by having that kind of relationship, you can't have that relationship without opening yourself up Go on. to those other feelings of being hurt, of being sinned against, of being wronged, of being, you know... Um, of, of, of people doing things that, that affects that relationship. And, and that's the kind of relationship that we see God have with Moses. We see it with Abraham. We see it so much throughout the Bible. You know, God desires that. That's the relationship he had with Moses. And he, he desires that for us. You know, God has held nothing back. He has held nothing back in his relationship with Moses. He has held nothing back in his commitment to, to his people, the Israelites, mm -hmm. to, to you and me today. You know, I think of my marriage to my amazing wife, who I love so much. You know, and I think back to, you know, when we were first married and, and I think back to how much I love her today and how much that love has increased. But but as, as we all know, in that relationship, 
there's a vulnerability there. Mm -hmm. And the reason our love has grown so much is because we have allowed ourselves to be that vulnerable with each other. There has been times of great joy, mm -hmm. great happiness, mm -hmm. great sorrow. Mm -hmm. I have hurt my wife so much in so many ways, and she has hurt me. Mm -hmm. And that's part of that relationship, that vulnerability. But it has only made my love for her increase all the more. Um, you know, and it just, it, it gives me a glimpse into just the kind of relationship that God desires to have with us. Mm. Now we're going to move forward a little bit and, and look again at that passage in Psalms 23 where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. You know, when I first um, caught sight of that, you know, we have this... Um, it reminded me of a book that we have at home. Grab it here, and it's um, it's called uh, "A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23." Um, small book that Amy picked up at a garage sale somewhere. It was written back in 1970. Um, but the author that wrote it is is a Christian, and he used to be a shepherd, and he he wrote uh, the book from the perspective of the imagery that we see in that psalm and what that would have meant as, as, as someone being a shepherd, as David was a shepherd, and what David was trying to convey. And I just want to read a quick excerpt from here. It says, The strange thing about sheep is that because of their very makeup, it is almost impossible for them to be made to lie down unless four requirements are met. Owing to their timidity, they refuse to lie down, unless they are free of all fear. Because of the social behavior within a flock, sheep will not lie down, unless they are free from friction with others of their kind. If tormented by flies or parasites, sheep will not lie down. Only when free of these pests can they relax. And lastly, sheep will not lie down, as long as they feel in need of finding food. They must be free from hunger. When we examine each of these four factors that affect sheep so severely, we will understand why the part of the owner plays in their management is so tremendously important. It is actually he who makes it possible for them to lie down, to rest, to relax to be content and quiet mm. and flourishing. In the course of time, I came to realize that nothing so quieted and reassured the sheep as to see me in the field, mm. the shepherd. The presence of their master and owner and protector put them at ease as nothing else could do. Mm. And this applied day and night. Because we live in a most uncertain life. Any hour can bring disaster, danger, and distress from unknown quarters. We have seen way too much of that recently. Mm -hmm. Life is full of hazards. No one can tell what a day will produce in new trouble. We live either in a sense of anxiety, fear, and foreboding, or we can live in a sense of quiet rest. Mm -hmm. Which is it? It has come to me again and again as I grow older. It is the knowledge that my master, my friend, my owner, has things under control, even when they appear calamitous. This gives me great consolation, repose, and rest. That now I lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, God, keepest me. Mm. You know, it just gives us a glimpse into, I think, what it means to God to be our shepherd. There's a reason we see that, that imagery in the Bible so much, that God is our shepherd. Because our Father truly is our good shepherd. And we're going to explore that with just a few passages here, starting in Ezekiel chapter 34. Okay. 
consult my notes here. Starting in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophecy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophecy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. Mm. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered, because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains, and on every hill, they were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. You know, the book of Ezekiel, as many of us remember, is, you know, was written during the exile. And Ezekiel is writing this and really just giving an account of the leaders of Israel and the responsibility that they had and and how they led their people. But then we see God's heart, starting in verse 11. It says, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of, of Israel, I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. With the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. We can see God's heart there. Yeah. How much he cares for his children. The lengths he is willing to go for you and me. I'm going to read this in John chapter 10 real quick. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen, but I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. From the old to the new. God's heart doesn't change. Mm -hmm. His love, his desire for us, no matter where we're at, no matter how much we've done wrong, no matter the hatred that goes on in this world, as, as, as Nick shared last week, you know, we live in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. The news can, can be so full of, of fear and anxiety and, and violence. And no matter where we are at, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're thinking, God, our Father, mm -hmm. is our shepherd. Mm. And he's there for us. He knows our needs. He knows what we're going through. He wants to have that relationship with you and me. He has a consuming passion for each and every one of us. Amen. And he has laid down everything for you and me. 
And I just want to share one last verse. It's in Isaiah chapter 40. One small little verse that means so much. It's verse 11. It says, God tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Again, we see the imagery of God being a shepherd, and he gathers the lambs in his arms. But what's unique here is the word here for lambs that's used here, this is the only time it's used in the entire Bible. Now, there's other words used for lambs, by all means, but the word here is only used once. So you have to go look at other Hebrew writings to understand properly what that word means. And it does mean lambs, but it's lambs that are blemished, that are full of disease, that are hurt, that are hungry that are physically not strong, lambs that um, are not, you know, that have, are weak and have strayed away from the flock. And God says, I want you. I want to gather you in my arms. Mm. No matter how weak we are, no matter how blemished we are, God knows. Mm -hmm. And he cares about you and me, and he is, will stop at nothing to gather you into his arms mm. and to say, I am your shepherd. Thank you. Thank you, John, for those thoughts uh, on Jesus being our shepherd. Very encouraging. Appreciate you doing that, our message here today. Have a couple of announcements. So uh, if you're reading Psalms, Monday starts with Psalm 56 and continues sequentially from there. Uh, women will meet this week in small groups. So if you are a woman and you want to meet with somebody, um, make that known, uh, figure out when and where it, it's all figured out already. But if you don't know, ask somebody, uh, great to have you meet with us and let's remain prayerful, uh, about all the stuff that's going on and that God's presence would be involved in, in world leaders, city leaders, state leaders, that God's hand would be on everything there. Have a blessed day.